Casual Pilot here, back for episode four of our journey from being an RC pilot to a full-scale pilot. It's going to be a fun ride, and I thank you for watching and coming along on this journey. Remember, if you like all of this, down and below the video, there's a like button. If you like my videos, that helps my YouTube algorithms get me better rankings and searches. And if you subscribe, obviously that helps because it builds my subscriber base and you can get notified if you ring the bell. Um, every time I post a video, you will get an update that says, hey, Casual Pilot has something new and exciting for you to watch. So make sure you do all of that down there. Also, there's a link to our my GoFundMe where I'm trying to become a pilot here on the smallest budget possible. And anything that you could donate to help on that journey would be much appreciated. Um, that way we can do it quicker, we can do it better, maybe get more ratings, maybe get more endorsements, and become a better pilot along the way. So I appreciate any help that you can donate out there. Anyway, today, the aerodynamics of flight. What are we going to learn about? We're going to learn about thrust and drag. We're going to learn about parasite drag, stability, props, and P factor. P factor is a complicated complicated thing. You'll, you'll see what we're talking about. And it plays a whole lot into how to fly a plane straight and level. And I knew a little bit about P factor from my RC adventures because I do get some P factor with my RC planes. But Jake taught me a whole lot more about the science behind it and how it all works. So you're going to learn a whole bunch of that stuff today. This was a really, really long segment. I've edited this video down to a hair over 30 minutes, but the entire video was close to an hour long. If you want to see the entire ground school, make sure you check Jake's YouTube channel. It will be linked down in the description. You can watch the entire video and see all the different things we learned. I tried to just narrow it down to the really hard points, the really heavy stuff that there was a lot of information there. A few of the things we touched on were a little more detailed and a little higher level. I want to get the foundations in my videos and I want to keep them entertaining. So I shortened it down just a little bit. I guess to uh, some of the forces of flight. We talked about lift. So lift is that force that, that sort of pulls up or pushes up on the airplane, gets it off the ground. But we have a force that's opposing lift and that's the weight of the airplane being pulled down by the Earth's gravity. So lift and, and uh, weight pulling upwards and downwards and then you have thrust pulling the airplane forwards but you have the drag of the air flowing around the airplane and being disturbed working against that thrust to slow the airplane down and as an airplane flies along in level flight all four of those forces are in equilibrium lift is equal to weight thrust is equal to drag and the airplane just flies along in a straight line. a happy camper. Exactly. Now, we've talked a little bit about um, lift and what happens when you uh, increase the angle of attack. As you increase the angle of attack, of course, we talked about you get more and more lift until you get to that point I talked about earlier where the flow s starts to separate over the top of the wing and then the wing stalls and you get less lift. So that, uh, that angle of attack where you get the most lift and just before the stall is called the critical angle of attack because that's where if you push it past that angle the wing will stall. Um, but that is where you get the most lift out of the wing. And in mathematical terms, they call that the coefficient of lift. And you'll see on some of these charts, for example, a figure 5-5, uh, you'll see the amount of lift is this red line comes up and it's labeled CL, the coefficient of lift. And where that red line comes up, you get the most lift, that's where the wing stalls and they say that's CL max, so coefficient of lift max is just a fancy way of saying that's where you get the most lift out of the wing okay. relative to the speed of the air. Um, now, something else to be aware of, figure 5-6 uh, here, so as the angle of attack increases, we make more and more lift, uh, 
anytime you create lift, you also create drag because since you require an angle of attack, the lift always acts perpendicular to the wing. Mm -hmm. So if the wing is angled like this, relative wind is hitting it, the lift is going up, it's but also straight up. It's, it's going like up, but it's also degrees. going back because it's perpendicular to the wing and the wing is angled up. Right. Um, so the portion of that lift that's angled backwards is experienced as drag. Okay, and we call that induced drag because the act of uh, creating lift induces that amount of drag. You cannot have lift without having drag because of the angle of attack. So, and on here in figure 5-6, you will see that uh, as the speed increases, the induced drag decreases because your angle of attack decreases. It's getting flatter. So the more speed you have, the less angle you need to create the amount of lift that it takes to keep the airplane airborne, and the induced drag decreases. So you might think, well, isn't it more efficient to fly fast then? Well, to an extent. But you'll also see here the green line on figure 5-6 has uh, parasite drag. Well, parasite drag is just the drag of the whole airplane structure moving through the air. The fuselage, the wing, the tail, the landing gear, all of it. And as you move faster and faster, uh, the air sort of pushes against the structure more and more and you get more what's called parasite drag. So the most efficient speed to fly is where you have the best balance between induced drag and parasite drag. So you have a low enough angle of attack that you're not creating a whole bunch of drag that way, mm -hmm. but you have a low enough speed that you're not creating a whole bunch of drag by pushing the airplane through the air faster than it needs to go. And you'll see that uh, on this figure 5-6 here if you take uh, the induced drag and add it to the parasite drag, you get another curve above it which is total drag and you'll see how that goes down and down and down as the induced drag goes down but then at a certain point the parasite drag starts increasing uh, exponentially and as it does that the total drag starts back up again because now you're getting more and more parasite drag from the speed that the airplane is moving through the air. So you'll have <coughs> a point here and uh, it's pointed out here as minimum drag uh, where you're you're being efficient with it. Right, you're being the most efficient because you have the induced drag plus the parasite drag is the least. So if you go slower than that you get more induced drag and you get more drag overall. If you go so faster is that why that, they define a cruise speed for a plane? Uh, that's is that usually right in that happy zone right there? That's part of it. Usually the cruise speed is considerably higher than that. Mm. But if you want to be most efficient, you could cruise at that. So speed. do the manuals tell you what that speed is? Or is that something you can actually feel in the plane? A little bit of both. I was just wondering when you were talking about that perfect speed. When you're flying, can you just like, okay, I can feel it's getting, uh, got to cut back even though I'm not at cruise if I want to save the most gas kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Just uh, was curious, can you literally feel that in the seat of your pants? You can to a certain extent. As you gain more experience as a pilot, you'll get more able to feel that. Where you are the most able to feel that is when you're on landing approach. And it, you'll notice that if you go too fast, it seems like you'll just be coming down faster. But if you go too slow, you'll feel like you're also coming down faster. Well, that's, so there's a happy. There is a ha there's that happy, happy zone where you're creating the least okay. amount of drag for the amount of lift, right at this lowest point of the total drag curve on this figure here. And you ask, is that cruise speed? Well, no, not usually. Usually we're going faster than that at cruise because we have the engine power to go faster and we prefer to go faster if we want to get somewhere. But this speed is the best glide speed. So if you if you notice um, on chart 5-5 where it's has this green line that's marked L over D, that's lift over drag. So that's the ratio of 
the amount of lift we're creating to the amount of drag we're creating. Mm -hmm. Well, that is uh, essentially uh, this total drag curve from figure 5-6. They've just plot plotted it upside down because it's easier to mm -hmm. relate Makes it to sense. some other things like uh, coefficient of lift and coefficient of drag. So you'll notice that at the bottom of the uh, total drag curve on figure 5-6, uh, that's where we get the least drag. So that is our best lift over drag ratio. And if you look on this chart, you'll see that is plotted as L over D max, or L slash D max. Mm -hmm. And that is our best glide speed. So that is, if the engine is not producing thrust, that is the speed at which we'll make the most forward progress through so the So we have one of those power air. out scenarios, that's the speed we exactly. want to be dialing we, in. Exactly. And when we come into land, that's also the speed we're going to use most of the time. Um, because that gives us the, mo the best glide range <clears throat> to make the runway. And that also uh, gives us the most flexibility in terms of being able to slow the airplane down a little bit or speed it up a little bit on the landing approach. Now when we come in, for example, for a soft field landing or a short field landing where we want to minimize the amount of energy that the airplane has at touchdown, minimize the speed we're touching down at, we might come in a little bit slower than that. But if we come in slower than that, that means we're creating more drag, and you'll actually notice we come in steeper, even though we're coming in slower. Okay. Makes so sense. So the best L over D speed, or the best glide speed, is going to be fairly close to the speed that we fly our landing approaches at in most airplanes. Okay. And... Uh, you can get into a whole bunch more math here if you really want to. Yeah, that's the part to. that made my brain hurt when yeah. I was reading through it. Yeah, so if you want to get into more of the math, there's a lot more of it here on page 5-5 uh, into uh, the subsequent pages. But uh, in terms of understanding the concept, that's, uh, that's the important part. Um, now, it does talk here about ground effect. So, uh, when an airplane flies close to the ground, it actually gets a better ratio of lift to drag than it does flying away from the ground. And that's uh, detailed here. Um, and this is why when you are coming into land and you're just above the runway, you'll notice the airplane is coming down, coming down, coming down. Then you get just above the runway and it seems to just float there. I mean, in fact, we call that floating, where you get just above the seems runway. Seems to smooth out there, too. Seems, seems to smooth out. The airplane kind of stops descending, and it just seems to want to fly and fly and fly until it finally touches the ground. And part of the reason for that is ground effect. Uh, and that is essentially the... Uh, the airflow around the wing interacting with the ground. So we talked about how you get higher pressure underneath the wing and lower pressure above the wing, right? Mm -hmm. When you get close to the ground, that high pressure underneath the wing is also it's pushing against the wing, it's also pushing against the ground. So that, that so air... all those layers we talked about. Exactly. So those, those sort of layers of air or, you know, pressure levels of air sort of get squeezed in a way between the wing and the ground and you get higher pressure under the wing. The, your, your flow over the top of the wing, your low pressure is the same, but as you get close to the ground, that, that high pressure below the wing actually increases. Right, because it's getting compressed. Exactly. And that, as you get close to the ground... Don't have ground, ground effect, but the, that's a good explanation. Yeah. So, because the the high pressure air is getting compressed even more, it's now uh, the difference in pressure between the bottom and the top is greater because you now have even higher pressure below relative to the same low pressure you always had above and you get more lift and therefore you can reduce the angle of attack and uh, 
when you reduce the angle of attack, you reduce the induced drag, and that improves the lift to drag ratio. And it just keeps floating. It just keeps floating and floating. Yeah. You take off and you get up to that one wingspan above the ground, uh, you start to lose that ground effect. And if there's ice or even, uh, it's I've even heard of it happening where the airplane has just been painted and there's a paint ridge that they forgot to smooth out hmm. that's disturbing the airflow. And this depends on the airfoil. And some airfoils are more sensitive to this than others. The Chief has a very... Uh, forgiving airfoil that's less sensitive to this sort of thing, but some very fast airplanes, some home builds that are trying to fly fast on a small engine, use an airfoil that's much more sensitive to disturbances. And there have been cases where just having a paint job disturbs mm -hmm. that flow enough where they get up to ground to the top of ground effect, and they suddenly you know they're flying along just fine, and then they suddenly stall because. As you get out of ground effect, you have to increase the angle of attack to create the same amount of lift, right? Because you're losing that ground effect. Well, as you increase the angle of attack, you're getting close to the stall. And if you took off, if you were already close to the stall in ground effect, and now you climb out of ground effect, well, now you've just increased that angle of attack more. Yeah, and I remember reading the, when, when you're taking off, sometimes it'll come up because of ground effect, but you don't have the speed to really climb. Exactly. And if you keep trying, you just pretty much float back down to the ground. Exactly. So I think I remember reading in there, you get off and you get in ground effect and you stay there while you pick up speed. Exactly. And then once you're up, right. if you pop off the ground too quick, you right. keep the nose down and get your speed right. up until you're well past that. And that's when we're taking off on short runways we want to pop the airplane off the ground as soon as we can. So you don't have the friction and you can pick your speed up quicker. Ex to exactly. <clears throat> but for the most part when we practice slow flight or stalls, we will practice it in level flight, which means the nose is going to come up as we get closer to a stall. And as the nose comes up, we call that pitching. So the nose pitches up or pitches down. When we turn left or right, we call that rolling left or right. And if we want to uh, turn left or right, put, take the nose left or right, that's yaw. So in the RC world, it took me a long time to understand yaw. Just turn left or right, and the yaw just messed with my brain. Yeah, but I totally understand it now. It makes sense. So. When you yaw the airplane, it's as if you're pivoting around, so, uh, you know, like if we put a pin through this airplane, this little paper airplane, and pivoted it, that pin would be vertical. Right. And therefore we call, we call the yaw axis. the vertical axis. If we wanted to pitch the airplane, if we stuck a pin through the airplane sideways, we could rotate it around that pin and it, that would be pitch. And since the pin is um, lateral, it's side to side, we call that the lateral axis pitch. And then likewise, if we want to roll the airplane left or right, if we stuck a pin through the airplane nose to tail and we rotated it around that pin. The long way. The long way that. nose to tail. The that longitudinal, would, that would the be, longitudinal axis. That that's how roll. I remember that it. Would be longitudinal axis. <laughs> that's how yeah. I. It took me. A, took me a few. Well, because it doesn't. It seems like ver, you know, vertical is this, but it's not. It's is and, it? and and that's yeah. one of those things for me. Right. You know, I've I've known this already, but I still have to stop and think about it because I just tell myself longitudinal. Yep. That's the roll. Yeah, because it's the long way of the plane. Yeah, and that's how I remember it now. It's longitudinal. Yep. The vertical is easy because that's this way. So yeah. that leaves the lateral as the roll. So for you guys, that's how I learned it. The longitudinal. You put it long way down the thing. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> that's no. That's 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 that's, that's a tip of mine. How I learned it. Yeah. Sorry, we've got vacuum cleaners going by outside. If you hear that, sorry. We'll talk a little louder. Yeah. <clears throat> so something else that we talk about is stability of an airplane. So stability is how much the airplane wants to stay right side up, right? So that's there's, a good thing. there's two kinds of stability that we talk about. Uh, that's static stability, which is uh, 
how much the airplane resists being tipped over to one side or the other, right? Then we have dynamic stability. So that is, dynamic stability is if you do manage to disturb the airplane, how much does it want to come back to level, right? Yep. So that's where the dihedral helps. That's where the dihedral helps in roll, and uh, that's where having the airplane, that's where the center of pressure moving that we talked about earlier helps in pitch. Because as the airplane, if you nose the airplane down, it'll tend to speed up. Well, that'll tend to uh, make the airplane want to uh, pitch back up. If you pitch the airplane up, it'll slow down. That'll tend to want to start the airplane porpoising. Wants pitch back down. Um, now, when we talk about if an airplane is flying level and it just wants to keep flying straight and level, we would call that positive static stability, right? Mm -hmm. So it just wants to keep going in a straight line. Versus if you're flying an airplane, maybe you've had an RC airplane like this in the past where if you let go of those sticks for even a minute, even a second, it's rolling off and turning one way or the other. Well, that would be negative static stability. I usually create that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I've had a few of those. Warbirds are notorious for Yeah, well, in military airplanes, warbirds and modern fighters are deliberately designed that way to make them more maneuverable. And uh, the other kind of stability is dynamic stability. So that's how much the airplane wants to come back to level after you've tipped it one way or the other. And uh, so if you, uh, if you say, if you roll the airplane one way, and then the airplane wants to, maybe because of its dihedral, or it can also be because the center of gravity is below the wing, uh, helps as well that will tend to bring the airplane back to level, right? We call that having positive dynamic stability because yeah. it wants to... In the RC world, the planes with dihedral, the trainers, they yeah. always would say if you get in trouble, just let go of the sticks and, and it'll, it'll, come it'll eventually come back to itself to a place where you can right. grab it and go. Because <clears throat> the trainers are designed to have very good, uh, very positive dynamic stability in that yep. way. Whereas if an airplane is dynamically unstable, that would be if you roll it to one side, well that airplane just wants to keep going over on its back and you have to work to get it back upright. And again, that would be like a, a warbird or a fighter plane. fighter plane. Yeah, my first venture from easy planes to 3D or aerobatic planes yeah. in the RC world, it was a little foam one and I I was so used to just flying without the rudder, just using yep. ailerons and elevator to make a turn. Yeah. I went to aileron and just knife edged. Yeah. Just kept flying sideways. It's like holy spot. I guess I got to learn to my rudder now. Yeah. And I learned <laughs> the rudder real fast because yep. it just I put it in an angle and it stayed there. Yeah. You know it didn't. It was weird. Yeah. But that was a light bulb moment for me. Yeah. Well, and if that's something else interesting is we talk about positive or negative stability. So positive stability is it wants to come back. Negative stability is it goes further over. If it just stays where you put it, that's neutral stability. That's interesting. Well, that one had it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one certainly had it. And they've got a little graph here on uh, figures 521 and 522 showing uh, static stability, positive neutral or negative, and then dynamic stability, positive, neutral, or negative, uh, showing how that develops over time. Part of the way that airplanes create stability, we've talked a little bit about dihedral creating stability in roll, but how do we create stability in pitch, you might ask. Well, we've talked about how the center of pressure uh, moves and where that center of pressure is. Usually the center of pressure or the center of lift when an airplane is in normal unstalled flight is about a third of the way back the wing. Okay? Or maybe a little bit a uh, little bit further back. You know, somewhere between a third and a half. So um, what we do is if the, if the uh, wing is lifting more or less from the middle or slightly forward of the middle 
then we want to make sure that our airplane balances right near the leading edge of the wing, just aft from the leading edge. And uh, so if we have the weight, we talked about weight and lift opposing each other. Well, if the weight pulling down is up here and the lift going up is back here, well, the airplane wants to pitch down, right? Well, the thing that prevents that then is the tail. The tail has a negative angle of attack so it's just like the wing except upside down. It's pushing the tail down. So you have uh, the weight of the airplane pushing the nose down. You have the, the uh, tail, the, the uh, horizontal stabilizer as we call it, the part of the tail that goes crossways pushing down on the tail. And those are essentially becomes like a teeter-totter where the, the wing is the pivot point and you have the weight of the airplane pulling down on the nose and the tail pulling down on the it's tail. A horizontal, stabilizer. horizontal stabilizer pulling down on the tail and it acts like a teeter-totter around the wing and it balances nicely like that. And if it's the slightest bit off, it's a mess. It can be a mess. I had a friend, we were trying to t dial in his RC plane and it was flying like it was tail heavy. Like yep. it just I could barely control it and get it down, yep. and he was nowhere near ready to fly it. And we looked at it, we saw some wings were warped, we got them straightened out. It still flew crazy, and it turned out one of his crashes when he rebuilt it, his horizontal stabilizer was, had the wrong angle of attack. Yep. Put a little bit of tape under there and bolted it back down, flew perfect. And it was yep. like, it seemed tail heavy, but it yep. wasn't tail heavy. It was balanced right. Yep. It's just, it's like, holy cow, that tiniest little... Yeah. That much made a huge difference in this plane. It was literally uncontrollable. Yep. When we're uh, when we're turning an airplane, uh, the way we turn is we bank it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as we bank the airplane, uh, the reason that we do that is if we just tried to yaw it around, well, the airplane wouldn't really want to turn very much because all that is would be turning it. You know, when you turn a car, uh, the tires grip the road and mm -hmm. bring you around the turn. Well, when you're in the air, the tires don't have anything to grip, right? So if you were to just use the rudder to turn the airplane with the wings level, the only thing that's gripping, so to speak, is the side of the fuselage. Well, that's not very it's much area. Right on through. It's just going to keep sliding. And besides which, then as you go, like in a car, when you go around a, an on-ramp or an off-ramp on the highway, you know how you feel pulled to the outside? Well, you'd feel the same thing in an airplane if you tried to turn without banking. So what we do is we bank the wings, and that does two things. First of all, that directs some of the lift from the wings sideways to help the airplane change direction so that you don't have This to, lift is pushing this That way. lift is pushing the inside of the turn. And then it also makes it more comfortable for the passengers because you're not feeling pulled to the left or the right in right. the turn. Um, but when you bank the airplane, some of that lift starts to go sideways to uh, help the airplane change direction. But that lift that's going sideways is no longer contributing to keeping the airplane up. So in order to keep from descending, you have to create more lift. Well, how do you create more lift? You increase the angle of attack. So when you're in a turn, you have to pull back, create more lift total, because some of that lift has to go sideways and some of it has to go up. And uh, there's a good chart here on uh, figure 5-34, which shows how as you direct more and more lift sideways, less and less of that lift is going upward, and you need more lift total to compensate right. for the fact that some of it's going sideways. When we teach people to fly RC when they do the turns. We always tell them to give them a little back elevator to yep. keep the nose up. And through exactly the, the same thing in uh, full scale airplanes. And you'll see that uh, you'll see that ha happen as we fly. Now, we talk about how an airplane moves through the air. We have a propeller, right? Right. Well, a propeller is essentially just a wing moving in a circle, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll notice that propellers have sort of a twist to them, right? right? So one, uh, as they rotate, 
that uh, twist is creating an angle of attack, just like it would with the wing. And it shows here in figure 5-44 in the book um, how you have your uh, blade, the, the angle of that blade is called the pitch mm -hmm. of the blade. And that is uh, having, uh, that is increasing your angle of attack, which is essentially making the propeller create lift except since the propeller is, you know, on the front of the plane aimed forwards, that lift is creating lift in the forward direction. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we call lift in the forward direction? We call it thrust, right? So that's, and that was something that very early aviation pioneers didn't understand very well. Um, when uh, the first propellers that were used were used on boats, and when they first started using propellers on boats in the 1840s or so, mm -hmm. um, they thought about it as an Archimedes screw, which is an old, yeah. uh, dates from ancient uh, Greek times, a way of moving water up a hill. Mm -hmm. And they just applied that, put it on the back of a boat, and it moved the boat forward. Hmm. Well, when they first started trying to fly airplanes, they figured, well, we can just take a boat propeller, and air is a fluid, right? So we just put a boat propeller on the front, and it's just sort of a flat paddle with an angle to it. Didn't pull much air. Didn't pull much air. So eventually, and this was one of the things that the Wright brothers realized that no one before them really had. It was one of the reasons that they flew where so many others had failed. They realized that the propeller was just a wing moving in a circle. And if you look, if you ever go to the Smithsonian Museum and uh, you see uh, the right flyer there, um, you obviously can't get too close to it, but if you could, you'd see that the airfoil on the propeller is exactly the same as the airfoil on the wing. Because when, once they had found an airfoil that worked for their wing, they just said, well, it works pretty well for the wing. The propeller's a wing moving in a circle. We'll just use it there, too. And it wasn't the perfect airfoil for a propeller. No. It's been improved. It's better than anybody else had. It's improved, been improved on since, obviously, but it was good enough to get them off the ground. It's better than anybody else had been using. Yep. <clears throat> and then uh, propellers have that twist of one blade relative to the other, mm -hmm. but they also have a twist from root to tip. So if you look at a propeller carefully, you'll notice that it has a lot more pitch right. at the root right. than it does at the tip. And that's because, as you see here in figure 5-46, uh, because uh, the tip of the propeller has a lot further to travel, going around in a circle, it's moving faster. Well, if you're moving faster, you don't need as much angle of attack to produce the same amount of lift, right? So in near the, the center of the propeller, where the the speed is not very high, you need a lot more angle of attack versus uh, out near the tip of the propeller, the blade is moving much faster, so you need a lot less angle of attack. And this difference in speed between the root of the propeller and the tip of the propeller can get so extreme that in some airplanes, like on uh, high performance aerobatic airplanes or uh, the T6 is the perfect yeah, example. Yeah, if, you, if you've ever heard a T6 flying at Oshkosh, it, uh, it, it makes a lot of noise, and that's because the tip of the propeller is moving so fast that it actually goes faster yep, than the speed of sound. Speed. Yep. And uh, oh. that, that sort of very harsh buzzing sound that you hear the T6s make, that's actually you know, a thousand different sonic booms hitting your ear in quick succession. <laughs> It's a beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. So, uh, something else that we have to think about in terms of, of the propeller is because the propeller is rotating, uh, it introduces some other forces. So, the propeller weighs a certain amount, right? If, you mm -hmm. t if there's a propeller off an airplane and you lift it up, it probably weighs 15, 20 pounds, depending on the propeller. Well, that's a lot of weight to be spinning in a circle. And 
what happens when you have a heavy weight spinning in a circle? It becomes a gyroscope. So you get some interesting effects um, when you uh, pitch the airplane uh, because of uh, gyroscopic precession that force manifests 90 degrees in advance in the rotation. So for example, um, if it's, this model is a tail dragger, so if it's sitting on the ground and you raise the tail as we do on takeoff, well that propeller is a spinning gyroscope. It wants to resist, it wants to stay in the same orientation, it wants to resist that pitching. But because of the gyroscopic effect, rather than simply wanting to push the tail back down, that force manifests 90 degrees off and that manifests on the left side, pushing the left side back and that makes the airplane, as we pitch the nose down, that makes the airplane want to turn left. And that's why as we take off, when we raise the tail on the chief, you'll notice you'll have to, you'll have to add more right rudder as the tail comes up and that's part of the reason why. Now, you'll also notice as we climb out, you'll have to add more right rudder. That's partly because as the airplane has an angle of attack, the propeller is spinning, but it's, the, the propeller is not perfectly perpendicular to the relative wind. It's on kind of an mm -hmm. angle. So as this blade on the right side comes down, the relative wind is sort of coming up, right? So the, uh, the blade actually has more has, angle. Has more lift on this side. Has more angle of attack and therefore more lift on the right side and the blade on the left side is moving up, it has less angle, less relative speed as well because of the relative wind and therefore the blade on the right side of the airplane creates more lift and more thrust mm -hmm. than the blade on the left side. So in es essentially the right side of the propeller is pulling harder than the left side which tends to want to turn the airplane left which means when we're climbing at a high angle of attack with a high power setting, so the propeller is working hard, the propeller is creating more thrust on the right side, turns the airplane left, which means you have to add right rudder when you're climbing because the uh, propeller is pulling the airplane to the left. Yep, I have that with the RCs. Exactly. And then the other thing that's happening as the propeller is spinning, the uh, it twists the air. So we have the we call the slipstream, the air moving past the airplane, we call the slipstream, and it twists. So as the propeller acts on the air, it'll push the air down on the left side and up on the right side. Which is giving you more. Right, so the, the air that gets pushed down on the left side at the nose will come around underneath the fuselage in a spiral, and it'll hit the right side of the tail. Well, when it does that, if it hits the right side of the tail, that pushes the tail to the left. That pushes the uh, plane more to the right. More, more to the right. So, um, as the, uh, the the twisting slipstream, um, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I, I had that I had that backwards. So that was that would be for a left turning and for a right turning engine. Mm -hmm. The uh, the um, Air is coming down on the, the left side of the airplane. Uh, no, it's down on the right side of the airplane. It's hitting the uh, the left side of the rudder. It's turning uh, turning the nose right. to, the left. to the left. So all of these things the the gyroscopic precession, the uh, the the blade on the right side producing more thrust, and the twisting slips. And we call that P factor, by the way. The Yep. The, the, the blade that produces more lift when it's moving downwards and pulling the nose, we call that P-factor. Um, but the twisting slipstream, um, as, uh, as the air comes down on the right side and around up on the left, hits the left side of the tail, pushes the nose to the left, to the left um, all three of those things are pushing the nose to the left. You're which fighting her hard with the rudder. Right, which means 
all those things require right rudder to counteract. So when we're climbing, that's why we have to add a fair bit of right rudder. Makes a lot of sense. I've, I've experienced that with RCs. Almost all my Warbird takeoffs go to the left. Yep, exactly. It's a balancing act to get it right. And that's why. There you have episode four of the journey from RC to full scale. It's going to be fun. There was a lot of learning there today. A lot of uh, brain explosion, oh my goodness, kind of learning moment. There's, there's a lot in there. And obviously I've edited down some of it because it was an over an hour session and I don't think you want to watch an hour. Most of my viewers want to see something shorter, more entertaining, so we've edited some of it down. But again, if you want to watch the entire video, there's a link down in the description to Jake's YouTube channel where this video will be available in its entirety. Um, so make sure if you're interested in that to go ahead and click on it and watch it. Otherwise, thank you for this journey. Make sure down there, if you like all of this that we're doing in the learning, Make sure you click on the like button. That helps my YouTube rankings. And subscribe. Ring the bell. You'll get notified of every video that I post. That way you can stay up on this journey. We're going to vlog this whole thing. Every ground school chapter we cover is going to be a video. Every flight lesson is going to be a video. So it should be a lot of fun. So again, thank you for the journey, riding along on the journey. If you want to help us on our the financial side of this journey, we have a GoFundMe that will help finance this dream and help us get farther along in the training and accomplish more. So I appreciate any help you've got. Again, thank you folks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the aerodynamics of flight.